I'm author and critic David Agronoff. I'm a horror and science fiction author, critic, and researcher. In this podcast, I wanted to provide in-depth interviews and panel discussions with everyone from New York Times bestselling authors to researchers, musicians, and anyone I find interesting. Welcome to Postcards from a Dying World. Hello and welcome to another special episode of Postcards from a Dying World, the seventh episode of the Science Fiction Hall of Fame series featuring A.E. Von Vogt's The Weapon Shop. So we're going to rock the Van Vogt today. And, um, I, I, you know, if we were going to do a Van Vogt podcast, I know we'd be calling it the Van Voters, probably. <laughs> um but uh, so we're the Van Voters today. And um, one thing you should know is that I eventually want to do a Van Vote episode of Dickheads, the other podcast, where we cover World of Null A, The Solar Lottery, and The Gamesman by Barry Maltzberg all in one episode because it's what I call the unofficial Games Machine trilogy because those novels are all feeding off each other. In other words... Phil was ripping off Von Vogt and Barry was ripping off Phil Mm -hmm. for uh, those books. And uh, but today we're going to be talking about this classic from 1942 um, that was published in Astounding. And we're going to go through like the whole history of Von Vogt and the story. But the my guest today now, a lot of times I pull on people who I know are experts on the author in question. For example, last time we had Alec, uh, Alec Neville Lee on to talk about Asimov. But this time I wanted to have on two people who were not as super familiar with A.E. Von Vogt, um, but they're super familiar with the guy he most influenced, and that is Philip K. Dick, who, if you had asked Philip K. Dick in the 40s, who was his favorite science fiction writer, probably going to say Von Vogt. Um, and, uh, we will have quotes from Phil later about exactly that, but, um, so I have two serious dickheads here, um, and, uh, perhaps the most serious of dickheads, one of the now five Davids, uh, David Gill, Professor David Gill, tell the folks who you are and what you do because you've been on Dickheads a bunch of times, but this is your first time on Postcards, if I'm correct. Oh, well, yeah. Thanks for having me, David. I am, my name is David Gill, and I'm a Philip K. Dick and science fiction scholar, and I run the Total Dickhead blog for oh, Jesus Christ, I don't know, almost 20 years, and I worked on the exegesis and new and. Uh, and Dick and did some work with her uh, memoir and uh, you know I had taught a class about Phil Dick last uh, last semester uh, sixteen weeks available through Morbid Anatomy. Yes, and you can go buy that class. That's right. And and learn it. And um, I uh, probably should have shut up more in that class, but I talk a bunch. Uh, um, and I was specifically lectured in week five of of that class on the Philip K. Dick formula. So um, I really appreciate uh, Professor Gill having me there. But well, let me tell you, that class is amazing. Every week there is something amazing to learn about Philip K. Dick. And there's really great biographical stuff and stuff up about in, uh, a couple individual books. Like um, there's uh, one specific reading for each of the 16 weeks. And if you read along and follow the class, uh, you will not regret it. Um, yeah, you might regret it a little bit. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work, and uh, and it's uh, it's an immersion in the uh, in the stormy seas of of our boy. So uh, yeah, it took its toll on me. That's for sure. Now joining us also today, um, I think Keith, you have been on postcards, maybe. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I know you have been on dickheads, so. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, Keith is, um, also one of my publishers. So he, uh, published, um, people's park, um, 
and um, at, uh, is one of the main people behind Choir Books. Uh, but Keith, give, give people who you are, what you do, and mm -hmm. like what you bring to the table uh, here as a, as a Dickian. Well, okay. Well, thank you for having me on. And um, yeah, uh, as a as a dickhead, I guess I um, first of all, I'm just a huge fan and have been for a very long time. Um, as a publisher, since it's really nice when you own a publishing company, so you know, I realized like, hey, uh, I could publish some Philip K. Dick short stories that are in public domain. So uh, we've done that. We have a, a volume one and a volume two out now. Um, Tessa Dick, Volume 2 just came out a couple of months ago. Tessa Dick wrote the forward to that one. And Volume 3 is coming out hopefully next year. And, uh, and David, you wrote the forward to that one. So we've already, we're sitting on that. Um, but yeah, I uh, love science fiction. Uh, I like to be able to publish it. Um, I also published, uh, Choir just published last year, a science fiction anthology called Augmented. And David, you had a short story in that. And Tessa as well. And some other people, it was, it was a great anthology. That was a lot of fun. And then for some reason last year, uh, I was invited to San Diego Comic-Con to speak uh, at a panel about Philip K. Dick. And that was a that was a blast. That was a lot of fun. So yeah, I'm happy to be included in this conversation. Any opportunity to talk about Philip K. Dick or Dick adjacent stuff is cool. Uh, I'm also an author, uh, but it's like nonfiction stuff. My, I, I published a book like four months ago and uh, just today, I checked it again, and it's still number one in its category. I have never had a book do that, where it's just, it won't go away, but I'm happy. I'm not complaining. It's just amazing to have a book like stay number one, number two, for like four months. Um, and it's uh, it's called The Quantum Sayings of Jesus. It's decoding the lost gospel of Thomas. And uh, if you're into that kind of stuff, check it out. Yeah, and one of the reasons why I wanted you guys here is I wanted somebody who is immersed I wanted some people that were immersed in Philip K. Dick and to get their first experience or get their feet wet reading Von Vogt. And I knew for a fact that Keith hadn't read Von Vogt. And I suspected that, uh, David, you'd read some Von Vogt, but not a ton of it, correct? That's right. That's right. Yeah. I read uh, The World of Null A at some point just out of, uh, out of you know, tangential interest. And then... Uh, the interesting story is that my mom, who was born in 1938, remembered this. She loved science fiction as like a 10 year old. So the stuff that came out around 48. And she remembered this story about this uh, creature that eats on an alien planet in a, in a through a certain sort of a trough. Hmm. And uh, the, the way the story is functions is that like over time, you realize that the this creature has like come to uh fit the shape of the trough the feeding trough in this sort of crazy transformation and i did a bunch of research like where the hell that story come from and the and the word was that it was a van boat story now the name of it has slipped my mind and is gone perhaps forever but uh that was my other van boat uh uh tread treading of water well, when we get into some of his history we um we might mention the story and it might come back to you but um, let's, let's start with the history of who Von Vogt was. Um, and, uh, he died somewhat recently, especially compared to, you know, what we're used to talking about with Phil in 82. He only, he died in, um, 2000. So only 24 years ago, but, um, considering like how, uh, early he was writing, um, and, and Von Vogt was really one of the most popular writers of the forties. He was active all the way through the 70s, but his major heyday of like popularity was the 1940s because he was one of the most popular and had the best sales and got the best comments in the letter section in the 40s um, uh, science fiction magazines. And he was a mainstay of Astounding. He and John W. Campbell worked well together. And for those of you who don't know, John W. Campbell, who was the editor of Astounding, often would um, give assignments to writers and which, you know, a lot of people, we talked about this in the last episode of the series that, you know, he came up with the idea for Nightfall. He came up with the idea for Foundation and and Asimov always wondered if if Ahe von Vogt had walked into the office that day, would he be the author of Foundation, right? 
And um, so, uh, but one of the differences between Von Vogt and a lot of the other writers from the 40s is he did not get a lot of assignments from uh, Campbell, mostly because he was Canadian and he wasn't walking into the office and he wasn't talking to him. A lot of uh, Robert Heinlein um, was, for example, one of those authors who got those assignments. Even though he lived in California, he visited New York quite a bit and he and Campbell socialized and they socialized at some of those earliest conventions. But it wasn't until the 50s when Von Vogt, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but he he was mostly a writing by correspondence. So his stories were mostly all his ideas. So Alfred uh, Vogt um, was uh, born in Canada, uh, April 26, 1912. Um, and he lived on his grandparents' farm in Edinburgh, Manitoba. And um, Elton and Vaughn, the A, you know, to make him uh, A.E. Von Vogt, uh, were added later. Those were um, pen name, part of his pen name. And eventually he legally changed his name to include those. But he was Alfred Vogt when uh, he grew up in a Russian Mennonite community. Um, but they spoke low German. <laughs> Um, I don't know why Russian Mennonites spoke low German, but that's until he was four years old. He only spoke, um, uh, uh, low German, um, in the house and, um, but, uh, his father, Henry Vogt was a lawyer and he moved to their family around Canada quite a bit. And this will set up one of the things that you see um, that is very common from the writers from this period, which is that they always had some reason why they didn't have a lot of friends and weren't going around running outside a lot. Uh, for for um, a lot of authors uh, from this era were sick a lot. <laughs> uh, and that's why they couldn't go out. But for Von Vogt, it was that he was moving all the time and he didn't have friends. So he was inside reading a lot and he developed um you know a love of reading now um there's no real sign that he was a big fantasy and you know obviously in his young childhood this was before the term science fiction was coined um in 1926 um but we already had hg wells we had jules verne we had all that stuff um but um he didn't really uh, start reading that stuff until he was an adult. And he had already started writing and telling stories. Um, but, uh, you know, he had uh, some kind of rough memories from his childhood. I have this quote where he said, quote, childhood was a terrible period for me. I was like a ship without an anchor being swept along through darkness in a storm. Again and again, I sought shelter only to be forced out of it by something new. So what I think was going on is that every time he started to feel at home, dad would pick up the family and move. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so, um, and one of the things that got him into writing was in what he called the dark days of 31 and 32. He took a correspondence course in writing from the Palmer Institute, the Palmer Institute of Authorship, which mm. is apparently a thing. And he sold his first story in the fall of 1932. And his early stories were uh, true confession styles. Um, and they, his first story was sold to a magazine called True Story. And most of these stories were published anonymously. <laughs> and people would often send in these first person narratives, apparent, you know, and kind of alleged to be written as true stories. But um I'm guessing you know, they weren't. <laughs> they were not. Yeah. And he wrote a lot of these and he yeah. started selling these. And by 19, it was 1938 when he started um, selling science fiction. And you get the idea that he kind of started to see science fiction originally as a marketable genre that he could go to to make money. And I don't know how much he really loved it as a reader, but he certainly excelled at coming up with interesting ideas. Now, 
1938, there was one story that particularly influenced him. And Von Vogt told the story about standing at a newsstand and reading the entire novelette of John W. Campbell's Who Goes There? Um, that would later, of course, be adapted twice into movies, including John Carpenter, Howard Hawks, The Thing from Another World, and John Carpenter's The Thing. Um, obviously, a classic of science fiction and yes. horror. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but this was the story in 1938 that really sparked his imagination and showed Von Vogt that um, he could do some really interesting things with science fiction. So he credits reading this story as the first time he really, really was inspired to write science fiction. So he ended up writing a story called Vault of the Beast, which he (laughs) submitted to Campbell himself by this time Cam- Campbell was the editor he Campbell was already the editor when um uh um who goes there appeared but uh to mit- not make it so obvious that he was buying his own story he wrote it under the name Don A Stewart which a lot of his best early stories were like Twilight which appears in this series the second episode of this series was also written under the name Don A Stewart and in fact a lot of Campbell's best actual fiction were under the name Don A. Stewart. Um, the story was rejected, The Vault of the Beast, uh, partially because it was kind of a little bit too pastiche of um, who goes there. But Campbell wrote enough of a nice enough letter to Von Vogt and basically encouraged Von Vogt to try again. And he sent him a story called The Black Destroyer which was accepted. And that was his first science fiction sales sale. And it, it it featured a fierce uh, carnivorous alien stalking the crew of a spaceship, which might sound kind of familiar also to a movie from the same era as the thing, but we'll get back to that uh, in the future because um, uh, that story became important. So the next thing in the history is that Von Vogt, uh, um, um, Alfred uh, Von Vogt, uh, got married and he married a woman named Edna Main Hull. And um, you will see that she was also a writer. She started as his typist. She would type up stories for him, but she started writing her own stories. In fact, she had a story in this same issue of Astounding as the weapon shop, which we will talk about later. And um, she was, they were married until she died. And she, um, com- she fixed up a couple of her short stories into one novel, published one novel in her lifetime. And um, sometimes it was published in certain countries with his name on it as a with a Yvonne vote. But the idea was just to help sales but um, she apparently had written it herself. As a couple, um, they, they uh, moved to California in 1944, and Von Vogt um, finished his first novel, Slan, which is a classic. Um, uh, well, he finished it before he moved. He serialized it in Astounding in 1940. They moved to California in 44. It was published as a standalone novel in 46. And that was his first time um, publishing it. In the mid 40s, he also wrote The World of Nale, which is a favorite of Philip K. Dick, um, which we will talk a little bit about in a little bit. But um, A. Von Vogt had some pretty interesting writing techniques. He kept a dream log and he arranged, he had an alarm that woke him up every 90 minutes at night, which sounds like torture. Um, And then he would jot down, jot down any dreams that he had for ideas and imagery. And then um, one of the other things in his writing technique is he invented a rule, which has been, um, which was one that uh, Phil, Philip K. Dick um, employed too, which is, Every 800 words, you 
um, he would enter a plot twist or an unexpected res- revelation or some kind of resolution or new complication and you know really tried to make sure that about every 800 words there was some kind of new idea coming and that is what he did to make his science fiction interesting um and uh the world of null a if you get a chance to read it um is i'm not gonna say i liked it better the second time i read it (laughs) that I did the first time it is a very weird book and you will definitely see hints of I mean obviously uh solar lottery is kind of a uh evolution of it um and so I've got a PKD quote about Von Vogt he said I started reading science fiction when I was about 12 And I read all I could. So any author who was writing at the time I read, but there's no doubt who got me, who got me off originally. That's what he says. Okay. And that was A.E. Von Vogt. There was in Von Vogt's writing a mysterious quality. And this was especially true in the world of Null A. All the parts of the book did not add up. All the ingredients did not make a coherency. Now people are put off by that. They think that's sloppy and wrong, but the thing that fascinated me so much was that it resembled reality more than anybody else's writing inside or outside science fiction. Um, I wonder what you guys at this point, um, starting with Professor Gill, like um, if there's anything in his history or anything that Phil said that really strikes out at you um, at this at this point in the conversation. You mean Phil on Van Vogt? Yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting that Van Vogt moves across genres and that, as you're pointing out, he starts as he's writing pen. He's like writing under a pen name under these, uh, you know, presumably truthful, right? So it's like it's blurring the lines between fact and fiction in the same way that the uh, the uh, the additional um, uh a section that was added to the Hearst newspapers on Saturday night, the Sunday night that blended these like stories of the Sargasso sea and pirates and stuff, but in a newspaper so that kids didn't know what they were. They thought they were reading news. Right. right. And so there, there's a kind of uh, there's like that early uh, middle 20th century period where the, the, um, veracity of the author isn't quite clear and there's like a question between fact and fiction and they they both clearly are into that they both get off on it as uh, dick would say right right (laughs) well and i love this idea that um what he liked about von vote was how uh incoherent he was Mm -hmm. keith you have any thoughts on that yeah well yeah just uh the overlap between um those two things like yeah the that the last thing you were talking about, about how, you know, Dick loved probably two things I would imagine. Right. Cause I can see these things bled into Phil's own fiction, but um, the idea of having something that feels very real. I mean, that's what I appreciate about Phil's stuff is that I'm reading these characters and they're not like chiseled, you know, perfect kind of like, you know, uh, superhero kind of guys. They're just kind of ordinary, the most ordinary kind of guys you you could imagine. Someone that if you saw them on the bus, you wouldn't even look at them twice. Um, and they have very real world, world problems and struggles like everybody else. So yeah, I mean, that element of writing stories that feel very kind of normal, kind of real. But then at the same time, the other part, introducing these fantastic elements that um, like the, when you were talking about the thing about, you know, what every 800 words throw in something a twist something unexpected like um i that's one of the things i i love most about phil's stuff so it's cool to know that he kind of got that inspiration from van vote um because like you know i know you're not a fan of ubik but that's one of the things when i read ubik that i loved was like it felt like i am a fan of ubik i just don't think it's the, his best like okay all right then. You. okay you don't like it as much as i do um but like with ubik for me it felt like it, that is what he was trying to do was at the end of every chapter you know, drop a bomb and make you go, what the hell? So that you had to turn the page and read the next chapter to see, well, what's going to happen now? And then that chapter would end with some other crazy thing. And you'd be like, what? 
and it just like it just goes from one thing to the next to the next to the next to the next. Um, perhaps, perhaps even uh, you might say at the end of Ubik, he might have gone a step too far <laughs> when I did it one time too many. But it, it was still, you know, and, and again, the thing about leaving things undone, uh, where it the the story's over, and what you're still going, yeah, it was awesome. There were more ideas in that book than the author had time to actually chase down, but that made it way more interesting because there's just so much stuff to think about. Well, one of the things that's interesting about World of Null A, considering that it was published in the mid 40s, right? If I start telling you like the concept of World of Null A and we talk about like what it's about, it's completely bonkers. And the fact that it, that it comes from the 40s is just one of the things that's hilarious about it because first of See, all, now, I've, I've never read it, so you should maybe you should give do that because I'm maybe other listeners are like me and yeah. they, they've never read it, they don't know what is it about. Well, first of all, the world of null a takes place in the year 2650, which is okay. like you know, very far future. There's a empire throughout our solar system, but the um, the society in it is controlled by the games machine and the games machine um which is similar to like the twisting bottle and in, in the solar lottery um basically creates there's a purge style like um day of lawlessness where um this games machine which is made up of 20 of like twenty five thousand brains so it's like a supercomputer but it's made up of these like living thinking brains like see if i start explaining to it explaining it it just sounds bonkers. yeah it sounds weird yeah yeah and um, so there's a character whose name is gilbert gosain who um basically tries to overthrow the games machine in, in the story and it ends up like kind of ending uh, because basically this future society is a non aristotle it doesn't use aristotle's logic this future okay. Okay. there's no aristotle's logic and the games machine has replaced that that's okay. what null a means oh there it, you go null aristotle yeah and so what what you have in this idea of it is what you see is you see like the um the roots of a lot of the things phil does like uh, government control you see yeah. like the we the very weird concept but one thing that's interesting is phil never went as far in the future as yeah. you know but there's still robo planes and interesting things that come out of it because it's the 40s yeah but see that's one of the that's one of the things about phil though too that i think is kind of odd is that you know it's it's i, I love reading his books but it's weird to be reading a book set on mars in like 1998 or something and you're like well that's the past for me but I understand yeah. for him that was the far future. Well, or an, another uh, timeline because right, um, an alternate reality where we were much more advanced. Yes, exactly. So um, I have this quote from the literary critic Frederick Jameson of Von Vogt. He said, uh, "Von Vogt's work clearly prepares the way for the greatest of all science fiction writers, Philip K. Dick, whose extraordinary novels and stories are inconceivable without the opening." that the play of unconscious materials and fantasy dynamics released by Von Vogt and a very different, more hard science aesthetic ideologies of his contemporaries from Campbell to Heinlein. So one of the things that Jameson is basically implying is without Von Vogt opening this door for this other kind of weird, surreal science fiction, mm -hmm. we might not have had that inspiration. Who else was doing that? You know, right. and, um, you know, Phil is the next generation and then we have the new wave. But and we see bits and pieces of other writers like tackling these kinds of things, your Cutners, your um, your Seal Moores, your Lee Brackets, you know, doing little things like that. But nobody took it to the level that Von Vogt did um, before Phil. And then then you have the Dangerous Visions era yeah and and um but that's one of the reasons why the games machine machine trilogy is so interesting to me because you have three ge three generations of writers von vote pkd and Maltzberg, in the 40s 50s and 70s 
all playing with this idea of the games and the games machine. Um, so I, I recommend that people seek out those three books and read them together. Um, before I do the podcast about it, I am working on an article for Amazing Stories um, about the Games Machine trilogy. So uh, you can get ahead of that by reading those three books. Um, and I highly recommend reading them together because I read them back to back. And it was a really fascinating thing to, to do. Now, some interesting things about Von Vogt's history, and then we'll get into the actual story. I know we've talked a long time before we actually got into the story. Um, and I apologize. The dogs are very loud right now. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sure you all hear that. Um, from 1951 to 61 is a very interesting period in Von Vogt's real life. After having moved to L.A., one of the people he became good friends with in the um, science fiction community. And um, I, you can learn about the science fiction community that he joined by reading Tony Boucher's book, the a fictional book, Rocket to the Morgue, which is a locked door murder mystery about a slightly fictionalized science fiction club in L.A. that featured um, Boucher from his short time living in L.A., uh, Boucher, Von Vogt, uh, Hubbard, Heinlein, they were all kind of living there in that era of the early 40s. And uh, so Hubbard and Von Vogt became very good friends, L. Ron Hubbard. And when he wrote Dianetics, one of his first converts and people who really believed in Dianetics was A.E. Von Vogt, who um, and his wife, um, his first wife, who was the um, Hull, who was also the science fiction writer, they became one of the first, like, kind of missionaries <laughs> for oh, wow. Dianetics. But idea. here's the thing. They believed in it as, like, like a scientific thing, like, as a, like, they did not like the religious turn that Hubbard took. So they were very into Dianetics, but not Scientology. Does that make sense? No, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And so from 51 to 61, um, Von Vogt's main like thing that he was doing was promoting Dianetics. But he did do, um, he didn't do a lot of original writing, but what he did do was take a lot of his short stories from the 40s and expand them, fix them up and turn them into paperbacks. So during this era, and one of those was the weapon shop, which turned into the weapons shops of Ishtar. And um, so uh, some of these, and, and another one was the Voyage of the Beagle, which was the Black Destroyer, which turned into um, uh, basically Alien. Mm -hmm. And he collected an out-of-court settlement of $50,000 from 20th Century Fox when uh, Alien wow. sued the filmmakers of alien because the voyage of the beagle and um black destroyer were so similar and mm -hmm. so yes and he did he settled out of court so um but yeah that's that um and then really he tried to write a mainstream novel called the violent man which is on my list to read about um uh maoist china um and he tried writing some science science fiction in the 70s but he basically retired from writing um and lived off reissues uh for the rest of his life and um i believe but i'm not totally sure of this but i think he had a publishing stake as an investor in dianetics so mm -hmm. I do think he made some money off Dianetics in the 80s when it became a bestseller. Yeah. Um, because uh, I think he had an, an investing angle. Mm. So. Interesting. Yeah. All right. So that's the history. Now I'm going to share screen with everybody. So if you're listening to the audio only, I apologize. But um, use your imagination. <laughs> yeah. And then... Um, we're going to look at, um, sorry, my Zoom controller is not helping. There we go. Um, 
we are going to look at the actual, oh, my cursor, okay. I apologize, everyone. My cursor just did something weird. There we go. Okay, here we go. This is the actual issue. So let's scroll back to the beginning. Oh, this is the this is the astounding science fiction magazine. Yep. This is December 1942 issue of Astounding. And that's the cover. And so our cover story is a weapon shop by A. E. Von Vogt. Of course, he was the most famous author in this issue. Um, so let's look through this issue because there's some fun stuff to see. Um, and including uh, Listerine guards against infectious <laughs> dandruff. People people massaging their scalp with Listerine. Yes. Yes. Every every Listerine. week when you wash your hair. Every week when you wash your hair. <laughs> Maybe that's a clue as to why you have dandruff. Right. <laughs> Don't neglect your crowning glory. By the way, um, and Alec Neville Ali, if he were here, he would say this, but I always have to do this for him. Uh, John W. Campbell hated the ads. He had no control over the ads. Smith and Street bought uh, or sold the ads. And so sometimes there's some pretty hilarious ads. Um, and um, But here's the table of contents for this issue let's see if i can make it i'll oh, spread the camp i wanted it to scroll. okay yes so let me make it a little bigger so um the weapon shop is the first story um next i do not know who cleave cartmill is um someday we'll find you so i cannot comment on that um but the last novelette in this uh, issue is piggy bank a robot story by Lewis Pageant. Does anyone know who Lewis Pageant is a pen name for? Lewis Pageant is a pen name for Henry Kuttner and C.L. Moore. They had tons of um, pen names because they were publishing so much. They There were times where they'd have two stories in an issue of a magazine, and to do that, they had to write under pen names. Lewis Pageant yeah. is one of their most famous pen names because it is... The, the, for example, the next story in this series is a Lewis Pageant story, and that is Mimsy were the uh, Burrow Groves, which, uh, of course, inspired The Last Mimsy, which was a movie even recently, and a classic. Um, and now, Phil, Phil did Lawrence that too, by the way, right? Phil Phil did that at least once, right? Where to get two stories in, this, in the same magazine, he submitted one under a pen name. Yeah, and... Um, Yes, and pretty much everybody did that back then. Right. And so it became a game to guess sometimes like, oh, this pen name is obviously so-and-so. And so, -and -so. And so mm -hmm. you'll see in the letters, if you read enough of the letters at the back of these magazines, you will see um, readers always saying, you know, so-and-so is, I, I think so-and-so is this person. Kind of makes it a game, makes it fun for the readers, right? To kind of guess. Yeah. And their other pen name was Lawrence O'Donnell, the, the Cutners, and they wrote uh, a favorite of, well, C.L. Moore. And sometimes with the Cutners is one or both of them would sometimes write under the pen name, or sometimes they'd submit a story that was just one of them. And then later people would have to guess, oh, no, that was actually a, a Cutner story, or that was a C.L. Moore story, but it was published under mm -hmm. the name that they both used. And that was the case with Vintage Season, which I just did a review of, which was a C.L. Moore story. Um, and uh, But sometimes these stories would end up in their collection. So uh, Barry Malsberg had um, a pen name, K.M. O'Donnell, which was a tribute to Lawrence O'Donnell, their pen name. Um, so of the short stories that are here, you'll see the first short story listed on page 28, right after the weapon shop is The Flight That Failed by E.M. Hull. That is A.E. Von Vogt's wife's story. And that is a uh, just kind of a rocket ship story. Um, I read it. It's okay. <laughs> it's not <laughs> super great, um, but it's okay. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, Sprague DeCamp has an article. That's an article, not a story. 
um, uh, later on in the issue. But um, yeah, so there's some, I think the other, the two, the big, oh, and then Frank um, Belknap Long, the two uh, follow knowledge in there is one of the other short stories. And he is um, an acolyte of Lovecraft. He was a mythos writer and one of um, um, Lovecraft's most prolific letter writers and people who wrote in his mythos and long wrote mythos stories long into the 70s, pun intended. Um, I don't know. Uh, you guys have any comments on this table of contents? This is a pretty good issue of Astounding. Um, it seems anyways. Um, I liked Piggy Bank, the the... I read I read Piggy Bank, I read the long story, and I read um the E.M. Hull story. And um Piggy Bank and the long story are both very good. But just looking at it, I don't know if there's anything that jumps out to you guys. That um well, it jumps out to me that it's almost a year into the World War II. Oh, America's involvement in World War II. So you know, Dick's writing later on in, in 44 about how the stories are are lacking because um, the good, all the good boys have gone to war or whatever it is that he says. <laughs> um, so right. it's possible that either these stories were purchased before the war started or uh, Astounding was still uh, picking up good stuff because I'm pretty sure it was. Isn't that letter to Amazing Stories or something different than Astounding? It was amazing stories. The yeah, exactly. So while amazing stories may have been suffering because of the war, it seems like astounding was still pulling the top notch authors of the day. Well, and um, we know that um, the Lewis Paget story could have been a CL Moore story. We have Von Vogt's wife. Von Vogt could not serve because of his eyesight was dreadful. And so he actually ended up working in an office in Canada, but he was able to write um like he was able to find time to write on the clock it seemed um and um de camp was actually working with asimov and heinland at that factory in uh philadelphia so um he was working stateside in the factories so um but yeah i i and i think long even though he lived into the 70s i think he was over the age to serve at that point so yeah, that is a uh, good point. And um, I know uh, Hollander pointed out that when we saw ads for uh, Philip K. Dick's boarding school from that era that it mentioned, like, you know, that the school was away from industrial targets, <laughs> you know, wow. so it actually, you know, people. So I, I wonder if we look at some of these ads, if we might notice some... Um, hmm effect of the war i think maybe your correspondence school here this get in step now thing here might uh well helping to train americans for victory and yeah it looks very military focused yeah um so let's see let me um so you had a lot of hand radio dollars a week that's a great job you can get there yeah and uh, so the weapon shop appeared here on page nine with this amazing art and an ad for old Mr. Boston brand rocking chair blended whiskey. <laughs> that, that has too many names. Is it is it old Mr. Boston or is it rocking chair? It's just old Mr. Brand rocking chair. Yeah. Old Mr. Boston brand rocking chair. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's too many. The whiskey's rocked at sea and ashore, inspired smooth, <laughs> mellow rocking chair. Really? Because that what makes whiskey good is the rocking. Yeah. You gotta make sure it's been rocked very, you know, thoroughly. Okay, so the subtitle here on the weapon shop is The Shop Appeared Out of Nowhere Abruptly, a shop defining law and the power of the Empress. The old man tried to drive out the shop and its two keepers a little task in which though his credulous mind couldn't grasp it, the might of the world of the world empire had failed. So before we start talking about the story, just really quickly, I'll show you, there is other illustrations here. And 
Are there any Virgil Finley in here? Yeah. And there's another one here. And um, and then that graphic with the uh, populations of the... Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. The whole solar system, Earth. That's a lot of people living on Venus. (laughs) Five million people. Yeah. Um, And... uh, That's five billion. Five billion. Five billion. billion. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And then... uh, just to show you, this is his wife's story, a flight that failed. Very cool. And, yeah. And uh, yeah, that's about all I got on looking at the issue. So yeah, that's the issue. Um, and so uh, Farah is the main character of the story. So so first impressions on the stories from on on the weapon shop from you guys, starting with Keith. This is your first time reading on yep. Vote at all, right? So what was your right. first impression? <laughs> well, it was interesting. Um, yeah, kind of there were, you know, I, I, I could see the twists. Uh, it starts off in one direction uh, and it had a twist in it that I didn't see coming. And then it had another twist I didn't see coming. So in that little short story, there's at least a couple of little twists in the story that are that keep it interesting. Uh, I mean, the beginning, it just seems like, you know, the setup is basically uh, one day out of nowhere, this weapon shop shows up in, in this town. And, you know, our main character is like, oh, this is this is horrible. And I have to do something about this and we need to stop this. And um, but of course, there's a lot more going on than he's aware of. Um, I will say. It was, so it was an interesting story, and I, I like where it went because I was not expecting it where it ended up. But um, I will just say, it there were parts of vote vote style that annoyed me. That <laughs> I don't know if anybody else felt this way, but he does this kind of like thing where the character is sort of talking to himself, thinking to himself, and he'll interrupt himself as he's thinking, and then have another thought, and then react to something. So, I mean, in a way, that's kind of cool to like if, if he did it like once, I would say, OK, that that's cool because people do that. But after a while, after like the third or fourth time, I was like, oh, this is just a thing that he does, I guess. And so having not read any other vote, uh, you know, on vote stuff, I don't know if he does that all the time or if he just does it in this story. But it's it's something that I definitely noticed as I was reading it, like that little tendency to have someone start to tell something and then ask them so interrupt themselves and ask a question about themselves and and not finish it and then go on to the next thought you know that's very dicky and it's the uh it's like the internal monologue we talked a lot about that in class about yeah. the how that relates to modernism and it's interesting that uh, van vogt is using it here but um yeah that's i i mean it's freudian right so he's trying yeah. to give a a, a a a realistic scientific depiction of how the mind works and it's you can see its repressions and it's and its biases and uh it's pretty it's pretty sub- subversive in that regard like to yeah. show that this guy who has this really naive allegiance to the government is diluted <laughs> you yes. know and at the height of world war ii is is uh is an interesting is an interesting choice yeah, yeah. <laughs> right and so gil um you, you're first initial thoughts of, of, of upon finishing this story and you, you've read a little bit of on vote before yeah. but mostly just out of curiosity no for- i was yeah this was good because it gave me a sense for just how how important the the influence is and that the influence is like um uh, kafka-esque also like mm-hmm. or or you could i would also like the the adverb or the adjective lithemian right like uh lethem some something like that like these uh a, a, a building that appears uh that has some uh, uh materiality but is also clearly partly a fantasy and partly a hallucination that's mm. um that's really cool i was really impressed by that and so i like that vivid imagining without the idea of having to ground it in a whole lot of like, why is it there? How does it work? Or, you know, is it, is it beamed in with magnets or do they fly it in and drop it off from the orbit or whatever? There's just sort of a, almost like magical realism of a, of, yeah. a, of, a, of a place just existing. Yeah. So now that's an interesting thing about it too, because in the story, you don't have, 
you do have those kinds of things happening where, like you said, it just appears out of nowhere, essentially. Like, well, how did that happen? There's a scene where he he goes out the back door, but all of a sudden he's not in his town anymore. He's in a complete, like another planet maybe or something. It's like, and then he goes to another door and he's back on his planet again, or he's back in the weapon shop again. Um, and so those kinds of moments are interesting because I'm curious it seems to me that it's more to show us that this is sort of the uh, almost nearly unlimited power of the people behind the weapon shop. Like we can do all kinds of things. It's not, we don't just sell these little weapons, right? It's, I mean, that's part yeah. of it. In the beginning, you the think weapons that's all are visible, but they're not the actual power. The that's shop right. is there's, the power. Yeah. That's right. There is all, there's a, some crazy level of power behind the shop and the people running it that they can do things that you know you can't even imagine um and so you know obviously this is it's on another planet it's in the future but you don't have this sense like when the main character experiences these things he's not acting like oh yeah of course this is technology you know this is even for him this is like what the hell right so right. in in the in the far future on another planet uh their level of technology is something that even to him feels unreal and like magic and you know what 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 am i dealing with here what's going on so I, I thought that was very interesting that part was really cool yeah and one of the things that i always like i think is funny about reading von voten because it's the 40s like um you know he has these vast empire stories and they're all set in the solar system you know yeah. and 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 uh which everybody was doing at that time you know if you you read the you know C.L. Moore, Moore stories or the Lee Brackett stories set on Mars, they're, they're very, you know, they're this other surreal version of the solar system that, you mm -hmm. know, we have to like eject from our minds what we know about the real solar system, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so there's lots of really fun and fascinating things with, that he's playing with there with this whole idea of the empire and what I liked about it is, is that, and, and I knew that he fixed it up later to add more things, but I like that there, one of the things I liked about the story is there's this feeling of a wider universe, mm -hmm. like on the edge of the story. And I like that, but I also really liked what you were saying, Keith, about this, you know, power being, you know, it's, it's not about the weapons so much as it's no. about, you know, the, this this power and 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 what it's going to say about this you know this empire and this this greater this greater thing and what the yeah. what the weapon shop itself means to this community when it shows up and yeah. and this guy's ideas of it don't well, the show this story to glenn beck that's for sure <laughs> because he'd have a field day with it because it, yeah. it is the it is the gun nuts dream of like the of the power of the second amendment yep. it's not yep. just to is not just to uh actually fight back but to deter the tyranny right i mean yes. the the it's a it's a it's weird. It's like a weird kind of druggy, weird story. Like, oh, this is almost like uh, like new wave sci-fi. And yet it's like the most reactionary Republican thing, <laughs> except that then the gun guys also are the ones. Well, they show that the that the that the, the, the liberal democracy of the empire is a sham, too. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's Glenn, like the right wing could have a field day. If they had any kind of sense of like how to imagine symbols and interpret them in a yeah. way that presents a world, <laughs> if they, had they would have a yeah. great time with this story because it's that's what it's all about. And uh, they wouldn't probably get that this Farrah guy comes off as like a reactionary who's like freaked out by everything and um, takes things personally when he shouldn't, has a victim complex um, and and yeah. like can't can't really even understand his reactions to things you know yes. like oh I'm, I'm mad about this this shop appearing mysteriously in front of me but now i'm strangely intrigued about its contents but now i'm mad again and it showed up and now i'm somehow in the alley of the store with the, having purchased a weapon to kill myself with i mean it's like his yeah. his uh relationship to reality or to the plot or whatever is kind of you know yeah, no, that's map. <laughs> yeah, so so that's a good point, David, because um that's that's the thing about it. Like it isn't 
it, if the character wasn't as you're describing him, it would come across like this is some Second Amendment, <laughs> you know, uh, futurist fantasy. But because the main character kind of comes across like a typical conservative Republican Trumper, right? He's offended by everything. Oh my gosh, this is wrong. We have to stop this. Oh, these kids these days, they're out of control. We've got to, we've got to crack down. Like he comes across like the kind of, see, so he doesn't come across like the person who would oppose there being a, you know, a weapon shop. You would think uh, if it was like sort of the, <laughs> the uh, NRA fantasy version of the story, you know, then the main character would be the gun nut and yeah. he'd be like defending, he'd be the one defending the shop, right? He wouldn't be the right. one against it. So that's kind of an interesting subversive element to it. Um, and that also brings up too, like I really loved, uh, again, as it, as the layers kind of get peeled back as you're reading the story, the realization that there's like a, a secret underground resistance movement and there are people he knows, people in his family, yeah. um, but they could never tell him that they were part of it, right? So there's that there's uh, this one sequence where like he pretty much has lost everything. He's screwed. Uh, they they kind of do this scam on him, and now he's lost everything. And um, and his wife is leaving him, and 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 m multiple people tell him you should just go to the weapon shop. That's all they say. Mm -hmm. But he reads into it. Oh, they're telling me to go and buy a gun and blow my brains out. I should just kill myself. And so he does. And then that's when he realizes, oh, there's way more to this weapon shop than I thought. And then when he gets when he gets out and goes back home, suddenly other people are kind of like, when they get alone, they kind of come up to him like, hey, you know, I couldn't say anything before, but, you know, I'm glad you're with us now. So that part's kind of cool too. Like, oh, he's kind of stepped into accidentally um, this underground movement that's, or that's, again, very organized and extremely powerful. Um and so I, you said he he worked this into a novel later? Yeah, um, it's called The Weapon Shop of Ishtar, I think is what it's called. So um, does, he, does he expand then on this idea? Like, is this where it starts? I haven't read it. I haven't oh, okay, read I'm it. curious. So. Yeah, I'm curious where yeah. it goes. Hollander's opinion is that the that the revisions are are bad. That, you know, oh. what Frank Hollander wanted to do was to be able to find these stories in their original form because they're much better than when he expanded them. So Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I will I will say this, that, um, you know, World of Null A grew on me as like, um, and I've kind of looked at the differences between, I went and looked up the original versions and they're not that different from what ended up getting published. And Null A was the first hardcover, mass hardcover science fiction novel ever published, by the way, which is a big deal. Mm. And, um, but one thing that you should, you should know about like when we're talking about like kind of how right wings it's a little bit of this feels is that in null a like you know one of the things too you have to remember is campbell loved superman stories it's one of the mm -hmm. reasons why like a lot of authors would write superman into their stories to get into astounding mm -hmm. and you know campbell famously told herbert that you know, Paul Atreides, you've you written yourself a great Superman, and Herbert was like, "Oh boy, if you knew where it was going, you don't um, know what you're talking." <laughs> here's right? the funny thing. Here's the funny thing, though. To this day, there's so many Dune fans who also still have read it and still don't get it. Right, right. Well, in Null A, um, Gosain kind of ends up becoming. He ends up having like multiple doubles. It's one of the things that makes it Dickian, and and um, he he does kind of like, you know, go against the system th throughout the book. And I don't know where I, cause I haven't read the novel version, but one of the things you have to think about is, is that when this, the novel version existed, when the members of Sifwa voted to put the weapon shop, the original into the science fiction hall of fame collection, cause this was all voted on. These stories were voted on by the members of SIFWA, the science fiction professionals at, at the time. <clears throat> and they so you voted mean that at the time and when this came out, these guys recognized that the story was fantastic and 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 sort of canonized it immediately. And because of that, we should read that there has to be some sort of political nuance, or otherwise those guys wouldn't do that. 
Well, yeah, I think so. But what I also think is it's saying is, is that they're not honoring the, the, the novel. They're honoring the short story, right? Right. right. They're, they're saying this short story. But what you have to think about is why these professionals voted for these stories, right? Because they got they all got a couple stories to vote and these are the ones that made it. And, um, you know, what did they see in this story? And I think it's the influence. And one of the things that, you know, I think you can look at, even if Philip K. Dick didn't make it into the science fiction hall of fame series, right? None of his short stories made it into this outrage, but, but I think his the influence that he had on the new wave, Phil and the new wave is one of the reasons why this story mm -hmm. was considered one of the classics of the, and there's a heavy weight towards stories from the forties in the vote voting. Yeah. Looking through right. here. Yeah. There's a lot of 1944, 45, 42, 41. Yeah. Yeah. 34 is one. Yeah. One of 1934. Holy moly. Well, well I mean, those there's the two from of... 34, the first two, uh, Martian Odyssey and Twilight. Yeah. Yes. This story's kind of why there is no science fiction anymore. Like if you pick up a, the New Yorker or Harper's, or you read something in like a high end literary magazine, they're going to have a, a mysterious gun shop that appears in town one day and all the uh, nobody in the town knows what to do. And so like it's a um, I think what's important about it is that it doesn't explain everything. It doesn't rely on explanation as its driving force. And so it ends up being this really pretty nuanced critique of like the people who are naive to the machinations of power, the way that power manipulates reality so that the you know people in power control how you how you understand the world. Um I I think it's a bigger, I think it's a bigger piece of the pie than even just Dick's following. It's like it's everybody. I mean, again, if if you yeah. look at what sells in literature now, it's this kind of magical realism in which these things are appearing. And then the key is that they have important symbolic, political, social, economic resonances and interpretations to to take apart. Um, so, you know, well, I mean, it's like it's far, it's it's like serious science fiction. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Well, and look. Von Vogt was incredibly important. He was the most popular writer of the 40s. And one of the things that's sad about how this all goes down is that he's forgotten in a lot of circles, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, if PKD, I think if you were able to ask Phil, like, you know, his opinion, you know, if you were able to ask him like, hey, your popularity led to A.E. Von Vogt being recognized, I think he'd probably appreciate that. Sure. But at the same time, he went up and down on these things too because he early on said that Solar Lottery was just a reworking of Null A. And then years later, when people asked him about it, he denied that and as if he never said that. So at, at another point, right? So he may have been defensive about how much later in his life, he may have been a little defensive about how much influence. And when he was younger, he didn't probably care, <laughs> you know, like, oh yeah, I'm influenced by Von Vogt. And then later on, maybe he felt like people were making too much of it, you know? Um, so I don't know about that, but um you know, I think, you know, we're. Sorry, guys, I got. There he is. Sorry, uh, I got kicked off. Sorry. Yeah, it's, all it's right. OK. Um, anyways, back to where I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Where was you? Where was I? Oh, I think we were just talking about the overall power of of where this stands in the Science Fiction Hall of Fame. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But oh, David, um, I think David was going to say something about um, I reminded him about 
Oh, I've, I've been Phil talking about Dick auto fact was what we were talking about while you were gone. If the the Phil Dick story where the factory sets itself up and it just starts <laughs> spewing out products and uh, nobody knows where it came from or any of that kind of stuff is very similar. And then the there's the scene where it's like the weapon shop owners show Farah either real reality, which is that the Empress sucks and she's scheming and, and or they're showing him a hallucination to turn her against it. And he's standing on this sort of dome of the city of the sky. Oh, yeah. It's very eye in the sky. So those resonances were really cool to me. I was telling Keith that it's, it's kind of a mixed bag when you when you see like the kind of where Dick's pulling it from. And you're like, oh, it wasn't exactly original, <laughs> but all right, fair enough. <laughs> inspiration. It was inspiration yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. It well, was and you definitely like see that. Down, right? right? It's like the movie Falling Down where the guy just can't take it anymore, That's right. you know, and he just he flips out. It's, Pulls out the machine gun and orders a cheeseburger. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And I think Null A definitely has lots of moments. Um, my copy of Null A, I have um let me see if i can find one because there's many times where i i wrote pkd with my highlighter <laughs> on pages mm -hmm. of null a yeah. um uh maybe i can find one but um i did it many well, many many place, times one, one place you get it in the story is um i love this it's in these first manipulating the knob to get into the oh, yeah. to the shop and the and the knob is like melting it says uh become viscous and slipped amorphously from his straining fingers it's like super freudian and weird yeah. and it reminds me of the the logs that prevent the guy from getting out of the town in cosmic puppets and it just shows that like um Freud was big for these early sci-fi guys and and like, you know, uh, Salvador Dali and uh, all these dudes and in sign of like giving a kind of a new sort of psychedelia of your own dream like, uh, you know, altered states of consciousness. OK, I found one from World of Null A. You guys ready? Yeah. Um, right. So. Uh, he was a man who claimed not merely the similarity of structure by identification with a dead man. He's looking at another version of himself. In effect, he was maintaining that because he had the memory and general physical appearance of Gilbert Gosain one, that he was Gilbert Gosain one, but any student of philosophy, even in these olden days knew the two apparently identical chairs were different in 10,000 in 10,000 times 10,000 ways, none of them is necessarily visible to the naked eye. <laughs> that's the Heraclitus shit. That's straight up Phil Dick, right? That's mm -hmm. that's yeah. exactly what that is. Yeah, yeah, and if you see my, you know, I have PKD. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It'd be interesting to know, like, where, where are those, are, is Van Vogt the first guy to do that? Or do you see um, that kind of like, mention of philosophers and philosophy in the you know earlier sf um, yeah stories. did he get that from somebody else exactly yeah yeah i'd love to know yeah. because yeah, i mean he, he's say, definitely but I, I haven't really seen it. um you know i haven't even i i haven't seen a lot of it with anybody else in my readings is he seemed i think that's one of the reasons why you know i mean this whole story of null a is all about this aristotle and philosophy right. so you know yeah but um, you guys you get guys that talk about bf skinner and you, uh, there's some there's some pretty serious mm -hmm. like psychology and philosophy that makes its way mm -hmm. but yeah the question is where where who's the first one to do it and i and i just don't have the the knowledge to to pin that down yeah yeah and um so here's one too like people sometimes think that the electronic brain system of the machine constitutes a development superior to that of man. They marvel at the machine's capacity to handle 25,000 individuals at once, but actually it can do only, it can do so only because 25,000 electronic brains were set up in an intricate series just for that purpose. And besides these operations are of a routine nature. The machine in short is self-efficient and super and superior. Ugh intelligent but it has its limitations these limitations are implemented from the beginning and consist 
a three broadly based directives. It must operate the games fairly within a framework of laws laid down long ago by the, by the Institute of General Semantics. It must protect the development of null A in the broadest sense. It can kill human beings only when they directly attack it. And there's the Asimov laws too, you know? Right. Interesting. Yep. Yeah. No, there, at, at Von Vogt that you see all kinds of seeds. It's really cool and interesting, but um, all right. So um, uh, I've got, a, I've got a quote here from uh, this is from an essay called AE Van Vogt and the world of null a by William Henry Sharp. And he, he goes to pretty far to summarize basically what uh vote is after he says, and it's very Dickian in the inherently immoral competitive fragmented profoundly challenged mid 20th century van vote sought a moral imperative he wanted to know how the truly superior human being operates and how human society evolves as whitehead pointed out this problem plums the depths of philosophy and the social sciences the answer emerges time and again in the form of altruistic cooperation so mm -hmm. That's the that's very very dicky and in its uh, worldview too. You know yeah. that uh, the world sucks and it's all screwed up. But the best weapon you have to fight its injustice is cooperation and love and mutual empathy. Aid. Yeah, that's like that's exactly right. Like, that's one of the things I loved about um, when I read uh, the Zap Gun was I love that sort of the twist. Sorry, spoiler alert, but the, <laughs> the twist in that novel like the way humanity um, sort of overcomes this alien invasion is with this little device that basically, or, you know, like a little toy that basically um, uses empathy so that the aliens have empathy for the human condition and decide not to destroy us. And just like, wow, what a cool way to work empathy in there is like empathy ends up being more powerful than some massive weapon, you know? And I love that. That's kind of cool. Very unexpected, uh, and yeah. Um, Thomas Dish, the science fiction writer, um, oh, yeah. in his yeah. introduction, yeah, in his introduction to the 1970s hardcover edition of Solar Lottery, said, "The opening of Solar Lottery is substantially identical to that of Van Vogt's most characteristic work, The World of Null A. In both books, a down and out hero is on his way to what seems a cross between a final exam and a job interview." Though suffering momentary doubts as to his ability to succeed, it is suggested that each hero's lack of success so far has been due to bad luck and possibly lack of effort. But this time the story promises the hero will try, and he does. As a result, he ends up in the last chapter as president of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> right? And then he yeah. also says the real reason a Van Vogt hero wins though through um is that his innate genetic superiority in the author's predestinating hand has thrust greatness on him slan is the supreme example of the corpus of paranoid racism while the null a books offer his most full-blown superman the political implications of traditional sci-fi themes have exhaust have been exhaustively and hilariously dealt with in Norman Spinrad's 1972 satire, The Iron Dream, Dick in 1955 could not be so audacious as Spinrad in the 70s. He is committed to producing a Van Votian intrigue that would provide his readers with traditional and vicarious satisfactions that he has found a way to do so. No longer need to offer a liberal sensibility and no, mean, uh, uh, no means achievement by no means an achievement so yeah thomas dish comparing the two mm -hmm. fairly interesting yeah. and this very is very my cool, copy yeah. of writers of the 21st century by philip k dick and every time i open it up i'm hit by the old musty book smell and i have to go like <laughs> this because <laughs> i don't know where i bought it from but man it was somewhere musty mm. but uh yeah i <laughs> i don't know um, yeah, I think that the the, the um, influence is a huge part of why we will carry on talking about Van Vogt. And for that, 
you know, it's, you know, it's cool that Philip K. Dick keeps his memory alive, but it's also sad that that's what it takes because I think Van Vogt is so important in his own right from the forties. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, yes, his, his role with PKD is important, but you know, yeah. No, I know other authors were also influenced by Van Vogt um, because I actually picked this up and I picked it up specifically because uh, of the connection to Van Vogt. So uh, Van Vogt, um, Lynn Carter has a book called Time War. Have you heard about this? No. And and he says in the book um, that his book is really a reworking of a story by E. A. E. Van Vogt. And um, so he gives full credit up front, not hiding it at all, <laughs> that he was a huge fan as a kid and he loved this story as a kid. And so he wrote a novel called Time War um, that's really just a, a tribute to Van Vogt. And, he, and he's, at the end of it, he says, um, if you love my book, then please go and search out more of Van Vogt's uh, writings and short stories and stuff. So you know, uh, several people, I guess, were huge fans and went out of their way to make sure other people could, you know, discover his work. My thing with Von Vogt is the more I read, the more I respect and the more I like it. The first time I read mm -hmm. it, I couldn't, I couldn't calibrate my brain to it. Mm -hmm. And I had a hard time with it. And I was like, Oh man, this is cheesy. Oh, I can't <laughs> take this. And then the second time I read world of Nolle, where I kind of like got on the vibe and the thing mm -hmm. about it is, is if you think about here's somebody in 1944, right as World War II is ending, is writing about the 27th century, right? Mm -hmm. And you got a vibe on the fact of that this is a 40, a person from the 40s writing about yeah, yeah, our future. Of and if you can vibe with that and get on the completely surreal out of dateness of it, then mm -hmm. you're going to have fun. And, and and you can read this and also if you just vibe on the fact that this guy was like writing based on dream logic if he's telling the truth about his system you know of coming up with imagery yeah. because you know and it's too bad he didn't have melatonin to take i was gonna say or yeah. mushrooms or something <laughs> that uh because well, that course, sounds like torture know, Phil Dick's mom was into both Dianetics and automatic writing. So uh -huh. there's all of that to, to, to think about as well. Right. Um, yeah. It just sounds like torture though, waking yourself up every few minutes and yeah, so, no, thanks. Oh, I, no, that, that is I couldn't not, do that for very long. I don't know. I wrote a book in the PKD formula. I don't think I'm going to write one in the AE Von Vogt <laughs> formula. <laughs> no yeah. interest. Maybe a short story, but that's as much as you're going to get out of me. <laughs> um, right, exactly. All right. Uh, yeah, th this was a really great discussion. I was really happy to hear your takes on. Um, so my next question is, are you going to read more A.E. Von Vogt? Keith? Yeah, I will. I think, um, you know, you're talking about how it's hard to get into him, maybe. And again, this, uh, this being my first you know, story by him. Maybe the, for the rest of you, you're not sure about it. I would recommend read the Weapon Shop because I don't think there's as many barriers for the corniness. I didn't, I didn't feel very, I didn't catch any of the corny Buck Rogers kind of stuff. Uh, it, it, yeah, it seemed really sophisticated to me and very interesting. Um, stick with it because, like I said, it's if, if you're getting a little bored, just turn the page because something crazy will happen. You'll be like, whoa, what's going on? Every so yeah, I would read words. more of this stuff. Every 800 words, you can count them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a, I, I'd be willing to add a few of his novels to my list. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. I'm interested. I think, um, I, I, like I said, the reading the world Nole and then solar lottery back to back is that, have you ever read solar lottery yet? Cause I know you haven't read. Oh yeah. It. I have read that. Yeah. I love okay. that. So you have read it, but you will, if you reading them back to back, it's really fascinating to see mm -hmm. like, you know, the later Phil, when he was like denying that there was any connection, really <laughs> <laughs> needs to go yeah. back and read Solar Lottery. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, Professor Gill. Yes. Are you going to read more Von Vogt? No, I, I enjoyed this. Uh, and I would recommend other people read it to uh, get the Dick connection. But I, I think there's uh, 
there's far more worthy uh time sucks than this one <laughs> uh yeah uh i mean you know especially if you haven't read like clifford simak or mm-hmm. um uh Ch- tip tree or any of the other sort of weird right before the new wave writers um and Kafka, for fuck's sake! This, if you haven't read all of Kafka, you should read that before you're spending a lot of time on Van Vogt. Would be my my basic mm-hmm. advice as a as a literary snob. Um, and, well, and we're two just, episodes gotta... away from reading um, uh, Simak for this series, and um, uh, I Simak is a, a, an author I prefer from this era. So yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, he's good. And, uh, and the uh, who's the guy with the the cats and everything? I mean, there's so much Frederick Pohl. I mean, there's so much like great shit. Uh, the, the space merchants and there's so much amazing material from this era that uh, yeah, probably Cor- ought to get at a kind of yeah, like an anthology of like you know the pre like the pre the pre new wave subversives. Mm-hmm. That would be a, you know a great way to look at look at that fiction together. Um, but you know like. I don't know. It just comes off like a reactionary to me, you know, at the end of the, I'm just looking at the end of the story where it's like, Oh, the important thing is to return everything to normal as quickly as possible. And uh, I, to a certain degree, I think that might be Van Vogt's uh, uh, desired um, mode of operation as well. I don't know. I don't know. I can't, it's really hard to read his, his, uh, his, his um, ideology out of this, but it's the here, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I think trying to figure out Van Vogt's ideology maybe not as hard as Phil's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, but but I I think um, yeah because it seems more anti-system and nulla than it does obviously here. But um, yeah, and I w- will I will say another author that I think that of the thirties and forties I I I'm more of a fan of Brackett and C.L. Moore and Kuttner and Cornbluth. There's a lot of authors. And Cord Wainer Smith. Cord Wainer Smith. That was the name yeah, I was Cord trying Smith. to pull out of my head. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he didn't actually get active till the 50s, but um, okay. he was fantastic. Yeah. Um, and he is going to be in the series with um, uh, Scanners Live in Vain. Um once we get to the fifties, he's the first story of the fifties because the last of the forties is Judith Merrill's only that only a mother um, will be the last one of the forties. But um, yeah, so, and we're going to do CL Moore next because CL Moore and Kuttner um, uh, collaboration uh, Mimsy were the Burrow go- Groves or Goves. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. Will be the next episode of this series. And then we're doing Samak. And then after that, Frederick Brown's Arena. So we get to, to do the Star Trek episode that it got turned into as a part of it. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, we've got some fun stuff coming from the 40s still. And um, so on this series. So uh, yeah and um so folks if you enjoyed this discussion um keith and um professor gill have been a guest many times on the dickheads podcast um especially professor gill was on our we can build you episode and our valis episode we did a standalone interview with him and keith we did a standalone interview with you too um and uh some things coming up by the way, that things that we should sell, um, besides Keith's um, short story collections, PKD short story collections, the volume one and two sci-fi lullabies are out. Uh, Professor Gill, you have a short story collection. I recently read it. Um, yeah. Well, it's 10 years old, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, recently. I recently got it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's recent in this time timeline. <laughs> yeah, and I recently read it. It was great um and uh you got a copy to hold up because you got a brand new box full of them i know you told oh there you go empire they're all slaves just like uh good old farah and his buddies (laughs) yeah Yeah, in times empire we are all slaves it is a cool collection it's a it's it's very thin you can read it very quickly Mm. and uh you can you can email me at the at the total dickhead at at gmail.com and i'll send out a, a happily send you out a copy of that 
All right. And thanks for letting uh, me plug that, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was a very fun read. It's um uh very very short stories, but uh very effective. So uh nice. really appreciated that. And um I'm hoping we can encourage you to write more fiction. Um yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> in the near future so um on that note do you guys have any last things you want to say starting with keith um no this is a lot of fun um i love talking about science fiction and i'm glad there's podcasts like this where people like us can talk about science fiction and uh stuff that we like and what's interesting and uh, i mean there's still new stuff out there I, i'm surprised i'm finding some newer stuff that i like it's not all good but I also love going back. To, like I love going to used bookstores and just picking up like Larry Niven and you know it's just old stuff like that and and discovering new stuff again. And so yeah, a lot of fun. Thank you for having me on the podcast and thank you for doing this. Yeah, and um, uh, we have many many um, stories to go in on this in this book. So people can look forward to that. So again, this is all stories from the Science Fiction Hall of Fame uh, in this series. So we, we've got plenty to go. Um, also, if you just came here, like maybe you found us through Bound Vote, um, there are, um, all, there's also a series on this podcast of 1930s science fiction. Um, and we did six episodes of 1930s science fiction um on a uh, similar format and there you can find some some Mac, some lovecraft um some cl moore and um great stuff from the 1930s including my favorite vampire story by cl moore from 1934 shamblo shamblo so um which i will highly recommend since she's going to be up next in this series you can go back and find that one where you get more of a history of her so on that note uh, fun stuff. Um, I'm not sure what the next episode of Postcards will be after this one, but um, I have the next month off, so I'm banking a whole bunch of Science Fiction Hall of Fame episodes in the next couple of weeks. So we'll be reading heavily from this. And uh, so folks, please join us again. And um, we will also uh, be doing um, some modern podcast interviews coming up. David James Keaton will be coming here to talk about Shallow Ends, his new novel. Um, I have to read it first, though, <laughs> which will be coming up soon. So, yep. Uh, on that note, I'm always terrible at ending these things. So, um, uh, Professor Gill, how can folks find you if they want to find you? Oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, just put your head out the window and scream. Uh... I'm at the total dickhead at gmail.com. I have a total dickhead dot blogspot dot com. Uh, whatever. I mean, <laughs> and I'm, my course is offered through Morbid Anatomy. <laughs> so all of those very illustrious sites. Keith, you do lots of stuff. And thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, well, I, I blog um, on Patheos. I just go to keithgiles.com and that takes you straight to my blog. Um, you can find my books on Amazon. Again, search my name on Amazon. You'll see all my books there. And um, let's see. I do a bunch of podcasts. If you're into that stuff, I do a podcast called Heretic Happy Hour that comes out every week. And then I do another weekly podcast. I do two weekly podcasts. I'm, I'm insane. I do another one called The God Squad that's live live streaming every Thursday night um, on Facebook. You just go to godsquadpod.com and we have a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, on that note, um, everybody, um, please check out the other episodes. These guys were on with me and we'll see you next time on postcards from a dying world. Uh, keep reading, um, keep studying the history of the genre and let's keep it alive. Let's make sure everyone continues to read folks like a e. Von vote. Thanks for joining us. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I don't know why I got kicked off. Ha, ha, ha.